Shalom and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we're discussing how Armenia, that is Christian Armenia, is under attack from Islamic forces. Warm welcome to the program. And uh, today's guest is Rafi Sarkissian. Uh, you're a spokesman for the Armenian community. Uh, Rafi, warm welcome back to the Middle East Report. It's been a few years since you're back on the program, so it's great to have you back on the program Thank today. Thank you, Simon. It's a pleasure. And um, uh, Rafi, can you just give a little bit about your background? Because being an Armenian, you, you have a, an incredible heritage, and in Ar Armenia as a nation. Uh, is such an incredible nation that was one of the very first nations to actually convert to Christianity somewhere in the third century. So can you share with us something about yourself and also the very precious community that you represent? Uh, that's right. Um, I was born from uh, Armenian parents, obviously, back in Iran, and uh, grew up um, and went to school, to an Armenian school in Iran. And um, just to add that the Armenian community in Iran has lived a very comfortable life and has always had a very good relationship with the government without any uh, complex issues at all. Um, yeah, I grew up and then uh, after completing my uh, uh, high school education, I decided to come to England and study, which I did, and decided to continue to stay here. Um, I've always been interested with the Armenian uh, history and Armenian uh, communities uh, worldwide, also at homeland in Armenia and in Artsakh, the nagorno karabakh region, which is the subject of our discussion today. Um, as a Christian nation and as the first Christian nation to accept Christianity as the state religion in 301 AD, uh, we've always been uh, at the forefront of the religion as religious aspects. We've always uh, cared for our history and our religion, our language, our culture. And uh, that is what actually uh, forms the basis of a nation to grow and to develop. Um, whether it's been in Armenia, whether it's been in Artsakh or in the diaspora in uh, quite a widespread of the communities worldwide, uh, we've always uh, valued our culture and our history, and I've always kept in touch with our communities as an organized community altogether. And uh, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, we, we did uh, quite a few programs to mark the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, in which um, the Ottoman Turks murdered over 1.5 million Armenians, um, which to this day, the Armenian community has not received justice or an apology on behalf of the uh, Turkish uh, regime. Um, and this very much fits into the current conflict, doesn't it, um, that we're going to be discussing today. Um, but can you share with us um, something of the, the dark shadow and the pain still caused um, by this genocide that took place 100 years ago uh, by the Ottoman Turks against your government? That is very true. Um, the Armenian genocide that took place in 1915 and prior to 1915, over 300,000 Armenians were murdered prior to 1915 through various uh, processes in time. Um, it's probably one of the uh, most significant events of history. And there is a lot of lesson to learn from that event. It happened during World War I when obviously the world's attention was on the uh, war and not much attention was given to the Armenian community that lived in the Ottoman Empire at the time. Um, it's worth mentioning that the Armenian community in the Ottoman Empire was very organized um, and it had an elite. It had uh, over 140 uh, Armenian representatives that uh, were active in Istanbul in, and in many other uh, or Constantinople at the time, and many other cities. We had several members of the parliament, um, obviously doctors, lawyers, accountants, and all sorts of uh, professions that uh, people were engaged. Um, and we could say that there was a reasonable relationship between the community there 
and the Turkic people. However, uh, during the 1915, the Young Turks came up with their plan, Jamal Pasha and his cooperators, to wipe the Armenians out of the Ottoman Empire and uh, make it a more uh, Islamic and pure nation as such. Um, as a result, they came up with very detailed plan of how that can be achieved, because Armenians obviously lived in various areas, you know, were different cities, different uh, localities, and it wasn't a simple case. They had to uh, work out a plan that would allow them to control the whole event. Um, there's a really deep study by Tanner Akjam, Professor Tanner Akjam, that uh, addresses all aspects of this planning and perpetration. Um, and it's worth referring to because uh, there is significant amount of documented evidence that proves the fact. And uh, it, it, it's beyond any doubt that these events happened. Uh, it was so intense that uh, regularly they were keeping account of what was happening. Uh, they were receiving reports from local leaders uh, telling them how many have moved to what location, how many have died in the process, or how many have been killed, uh, and uh, the percentage that have survived. And then they would get additional instructions as to what the next step would be, whether they move them on and cause more, more death, or sometimes they would just kill them um, in order to achieve their uh, objective. Obviously, they use an excuse that the Armenians would probably side with Russians, but that is just an excuse, and it's not the reality. Um, the Armenians that were very happy living in the Ottoman Empire and uh, producing and uh, contributing to the country had no reason to um, put anything as far as the country goes on in danger. Um, that's one reason. The other reason is if you look at proportions, the Armenian population was uh, about two and a half million compared with a you know, huge proportion of Turkic people. And therefore, uh, there is no reason for Armenians to think that Angon, we might want to do something clever as such, uh, inverted commas, because uh, that wouldn't have made sense at all. So all these excuses are, that are being uh, suggested by Erdogan and his followers and his predece predecessors are uh, pointless. Um, the fact is that over 34 countries in the world have recognized the Armenian genocide. The recent one uh, through the Senate in the United States even recognized, who is a very close ally of Turkey. Uh, yet Erdogan is adamant to accept that uh, the fact of history cannot be denied. And he continues to deny, as he does deny the rights for the Kurdish people and the rights for minorities, the rights for the journalists to be free and to address any issues that they wish. And right now we have over 600 journalists that are uh, in prison in uh, Turkey because Erdogan doesn't like what they say. Um, and obviously if Erdogan had a proper leadership and proper uh, governing capacity, then uh, there wouldn't have been a coup against, her, against him. So, uh, I think he, he needs to sit back and think for a while as to what exactly is there to achieve. Because with the, uh, the Armenian genocide, uh, we, we saw the mass deportation of the Armenian populations, the, the death marches in, in the desert, the concentration camps for the first kind, and even uh, gassing Armenians uh, in caves as well. So in, in a sense, and we discussed this program a few years ago, if it wasn't for the Armenian genocide, and the genocide against Christians uh, is believed to be about 2.5 million uh, Christians were murdered by the Ottoman Turks during that period. Um, the Holocaust would never have happened. Absolutely. Um, it's a definite case that firstly there is a large number of similarities between what happened to the Armenian genocide and what examples were used uh, by Germans uh, at the time for the Holocaust. Um, and it's also known, and it's also public, that uh, some of the German officers that served in Ottoman Empire were advising Hitler at the time of the Holocaust. Uh, so th besides parallel, there is actually evidence of actual participation by officers that knew what they were doing and how they were helping the uh, Ottoman Empire to implement the plan. Absolutely, and, and Hitler's uh, famous letter to the, the SS before they invaded Poland was uh, uh, when the German officers were essentially saying, well, what are the repercussions for us if we invade Poland? And uh, I think ins they used the example of the Armenian genocide, and Hitler's response was, the Armenians, who remembers them? 
uh, was, was a famous quote. But let's have a look now at uh, a brief history of the what is known as the Forgotten Genocide, where over 1.5 million Armenian, Armenians were murdered at the hands of the Ottoman Turks during the First World War. On April 24, 1915, Turkish authorities in the Ottoman Empire began to systematically exterminate their Armenian subjects. Over the next three years, hundreds of thousands of Armenians were deported from their ancestral towns and villages. These so-called deportations consisted of death marches into the desert where men, women, and children died of dehydration, starvation, and disease. If, that is, they had not already succumbed to torture, rape, and murder along the way. In the end, up to 1.5 million Armenians were massacred. The centennial of the Armenian Genocide was marked all over the world on April 24, 2015. While this day was dedicated to commemorating the victims, there were also demonstrations demanding recognition of the genocide. Why? Because the Turkish government still denies that the systematic slaughter of the Armenians in 1915 constituted genocide. This, despite countless eyewitness testimonies, news reports, and government documents from Armenian, Turkish, German, British, and American sources, such as the U.S. Ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, Henry Morgenthau, who tried to convince his government to put a stop to what he called the murder of a nation. While more than 25 countries, including Canada, have officially acknowledged the genocide, this cannot make up for the fact that Turkey continues its denialism. Does it even matter that Turkey refuses to recognize the Armenian Genocide 100 years later? Or is it important to recognize this fact in history and challenge genocide denial? How might our point of view affect the way that we interpret our past and future actions? First, to tolerate genocide denial is to be complicit in the last stage of genocide. Extermination took away 1.5 million innocent lives. Denial threatens to take away the very memory of those lives. If denial succeeds, it will look as if the victims had never even existed. Following this rationale, if denial is allowed to erase genocide from history books, it would be impossible to commit to the mantra, never again. In 1939, Hitler stated, the aim of war is to annihilate the enemy physically. Who today still speaks of the massacre of the Armenians? Could recognition of the race murder of the Armenians have discouraged Hitler from his own genocidal designs and perhaps helped to minimize the occurrence of future genocide? Encouragingly, over the past few years, in what Turkish-American historian Taner Akşam calls the other Turkey, a growing number of Turkish writers, intellectuals, and human rights advocates have publicly acknowledged the Armenian Genocide and courageously called for the Turkish government to do the same, to come to terms with history. Although we often dismiss history as nothing more than times past, we must recognize that it informs our current and future perspectives, beliefs, and values. It's important, therefore, to acquire and maintain a truthful, uncensored account of our history, including the pages that bring us shame as well as those that make us proud. Uh, Elias Agopian Taft was one of the survivors. There were not many, but some of them did uh, write memoirs of their experiences. She wrote a uh, autobiographical uh, book uh, titled Rebirth, in which she recounts her uh, life story and the tribulations she went through between 1915 and 1922. She was a small girl in a coastal town of, of Bandirma, or Bandirma, uh, which is uh, near the Aegean Sea or the Sea of Marmara, uh, nowhere near the uh, Russian front, uh, and in living in a peaceful uh, Armenian community among Greeks, uh, Turks, and, and others. It was a multicultural, multi-ethnic town. Uh, a very beautiful uh, town on the sea. She had no idea what was happening in 1915 when they were um, preparing to deport them. She even remembers being excited by the fact 
that they were told that they had to move because she had never been away from her town. And now there was the opportunity to sit on a train, uh, little realizing that train was going to be uh, the first uh, part of a death march that took her southward. And the train ride very quickly uh, was not a pleasure trip ride because they packed hundreds of people into one cattle car, took them southward toward Konya, and then they had to walk. And they walked all the way to the desert where all along the way she was, as a little girl, witness to uh, extreme cruelty. Azaz. That was the worst place I can remember. The people were separated into two groups. One, some families had to go to Damascus because they needed us. And my brother, Garo, put some kind of a trade on every uh, life certificate. And the others went, supposed to go to Derzor. I saw with my own eyes a poor neighbor of ours from Bandarma. She couldn't walk anymore, and uh, they took hold of her and threw her into the burning fire. And my father's first cousin, Hagop, Der Hagopian, lost his mind in front of us. Then we were supposed to be the fortunate ones. Then we went. They put us on train again towards the Syrian desert. My baby sister died on the train there. She was only four years old. And my parents just buried her by the uh, railroad tracks there. And uh, what happened to the Armenian people uh, was nothing worse than absolutely shocking. And it's a time that Turkey came to terms with their uh, past and uh, apologize for their behavior during the First World War. But also, if you want to know more about the Armenian genocide, can I, recognize, can I recommend an excellent film called The Promise? that's worth watching. It's also on Netflix as well. So if you want to know what happened, that's a film that I recommend. Um, Rafi, um, you know, it's a very difficult subject to, to deal with, um, the issue of, uh, of, of the genocide. And, and we know that after, for example, the Second World War, that um, Armenia became a province of the uh, Soviet uh, Union. What was life like for Armenians living under the Soviet Union? OK. Um you could look at that in two stages. First, um, uh, after the genocide and up to 2018-19 and 2020, sorry, 19, uh, 1918-19 and 1920. Um, what happened then, uh, as the situation was developing after the World War, uh, Armenians managed to uh, unite, man managed to get together and form an army and they fought the Turkish, uh, Turkish army and they won and they established the first independent republic of Armenia. Um, obviously, following the uh, establishment of the uh, uh, republic as such, they formed the government and they had constitution and everything was organized properly. They had their army and everything. Um, however, the fact of the situation following the war make the, made it very difficult to manage. And at the same time, there was a lot of pressure exerted by Turkey in order to influence and change the politics of uh, the ongoing politics uh, in the region as well as uh, in, the, in Europe as well. So um, because of that unstable situation politically and because of the economy as well, that uh, it was really difficult to uh, come from uh, almost a situation of hunger to try and manage a country. Uh, and the threat of uh, the Turkey being upon the uh, Armenian people, then uh, they decided to uh, opt for becoming a Soviet uh, uh, or join the Soviet Union. Uh, and that was considered uh, the only option at the time. Otherwise, we would, they would have tried to uh, survive as much as possible as a republic. Um, so that's the start of the Sovietization of Armenia as such. Uh, following that, uh, as the Soviet Union went through its recovery and um, 
post-revolution, etc., and establishing a union as such. Uh, Armenia has lived re relatively a comfortable life. Uh, because of the organization of the Soviet Union, obviously the same applied to uh, the Armenian Republic as well as uh, part of Soviet Union. And um, that aspect of uh, an organized approach to how the state should uh, function and operate, obviously with KV KGB's presence and uh, all the uh, implications that brings, uh, the, the country generally managed to um, live a reasonable uh, and comfortable life. However, politically, they were um, under a lot of pressure and they didn't have that much say as to how they want to govern, what they want to express as a nation and so on, until uh, um, the 50th anniversary of the genocide that uh, they thought enough is enough, we have to voice, and uh, they came out with a large protest. Uh, and uh, the Cicero Nagabert uh, Memorial for the Genocide, um, they walked to it and uh, they established the concept of we, we demand recognition of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, and obviously uh, the diaspora followed. <clears throat> and uh, from then on we have voiced the issue of recognition far uh, stronger and uh, we've achieved uh, significant uh, results because of it. Uh, also, um Armenia gained its independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union in um, 1991. Um, and, and also, can you talk in this context, because we saw in the Nagorno-Karabakh, Nagorno the current area that's under conflict at the moment, because ethnically it has, uh, the majority is Armenian, um, but Azerbaijan see this as their territory, and, and then you had a bitter war for almost two years, from 92 yeah. to 94. Um, can you explain the reasons behind uh, this, this conflict? Sure. Um, the, in terms of history, if you look at the history, you look at history and look at how um, the whole situation develops in the region, in the Caucasus. Um, firstly, Armenia has been there for a millennia. Um, and uh, it's known that the Yerevan is older than Rome. Um, but more significantly in this case, Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, as the Armenians call it and have called it for centuries, um, has always been an Armenian populated region. Uh, and it generally has remained self-governing. Uh, what, if there are anyone interested, they could read about the, uh, the uh, Melikets of Karabakh or uh, Artsakh. Um, basically, they were self-governing uh, regions that uh, they would run their own issues and govern uh, what's needed for the region. Uh, and historically, it's always been Armenian populated. Um, now, what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed is that Azerbaijan, Armenia, and many others announced their independence and came out demanding uh, to become independent, and they succeeded. But what is being ignored a lot by the media, by BBC, and by other news sources, is that the people of Nagorno-Karabakh did the same. They uh, announced that they want to become independent. Um, and the reason that they wanted to do that is very simple, because they felt that being part of Azerbaijan was a danger. And why Nagorno-Karabakh, that was part of Armenia, became a Azerbaijani region is simply a historical fact again, and that can be also substantiated, and that was Stalin, that in his dealings with Azerbaijan and with Turkey, he wanted to keep them sweet. And he decided that he will give the region of Nagorno-Karabakh and south of Armenia, which is uh, Nakhchevan, to uh, Azerbaijan to keep them happy. Um, so by doing that uh, critical political mistake, strictly speaking, he uh, gifted Azerbaijan by the two regions and created a huge problem for the population. Without thinking that, hang on, I'm actually ignoring the fact that Turkic nations committed the genocide against the Armenians, and I'm giving an Armenian region to a Turkic nation, which is Azeris. Um, so that is uh, the key problem. And I see every right for the Armenian people to demand their independence and to, to demand their security and freedom. Uh, the other point that is also being ignored, and unfortunately 
uh, news agencies don't really focus on the key issue. Uh, let's look at Azerbaijan as a nation and le let's look at the Armenians that are living in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is an oil-rich country. Uh, I would be very happy to live in an oil-rich country and benefit from what it brings. So for the Ar Armenian people in Karabakh, there would have been no reason for them to want to become independent if Azeri government was kind enough to the people that it rules. Absolutely. Unfortunately, they weren't. And there is several evidence, especially Baroness Cox uh, of the uh, House of Lords has uh, performed uh, 84, maybe more now, trips to Karabakh. And uh, she's fully informed of to what extent the Azeri government had put uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians under uh, pressure and uh, by threatening them, by uh, causing all sorts of uh, uh, sporadic attacks and uh, sometimes shelling and bombing uh, created a um, situation that the army people uh, couldn't uh, um, couldn't maintain anymore, and they had to take measures in order to prevent the situation. Um, obviously, being their land for uh, as an ancestral land, they're not going to walk out. Obviously, they would attempt to uh, defend themselves, um, and unfortunately, Azeri government has never realized that by doing what it does, it creates a huge problem for themselves and for the Armenian community that lives in there. Uh, when they announced to become independent in Nagorno-Karabakh, what happened is that Azeri mob in Baku and Sumgait attacked the Armenian population there and committed the pogroms. Um, and that is another indication that the genocide is just behind the door. And if you're not careful, and if we allow Azeris to open the doors into the Karabakh region, the army population won't have a chance. Having said that, we should also realize that Azeris and Azerbaijan as a government is far uh, stronger militarily and in terms of uh, weapons uh, compared with that of uh, Armenia or, Azerbaijan or Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, at the least, they have doubled what Armenia has and certainly have uh, multiple of what Nagorno-Karabakh uh, community or Armenians living there have. Um, so we need to realize that we are create or we have created a situation there politically um, that causes a huge pressure on the Armenians to try and survive and try and stay on the land that they have built for centuries and to uh, create a life for themselves that would secure their family and their communities. Um, now, the other point that comes up also is the fact that Azeris keep blaming Armenians, that Armenians are the ones that, uh, um, that don't respect the ceasefire, and they keep firing on Azerbaijan. Well, look at the fact. If Armenia, that has far less capability militarily, is the initiator, how could that be justifiable? Um, we've tried to convince Azerbaijan to agree for a ceasefire monitoring force to be present, and they've constantly um, uh, refused that. So th the situation is, as I've explained, and it needs to change. So let's have a look at this excellent uh, report um, put together by Chris Mitchell and uh, his program, Jerusalem Dateline, looking at the conflict in Armenia. In the midst of heavy artillery fire, thousands of refugees are fleeing, while others seek shelter inside the war zone. Bombing. Buildings and houses are destroyed. We are so afraid of it. How can one stand it? How long will it last? The disputed area of Nagorno-Karabakh sits here between Armenia and Azerbaijan. When the Soviet Union fell in 1991, this self-governed region of Azerbaijan voted to join Armenia. Shortly after growing tension between Armenian Christians and mostly Muslim Azeris led to war. An estimated 30,000 died in that war. When the fighting stopped, Armenian forces controlled Nagorno-Karabakh, while the international community recognized it as part of Azerbaijan. The conflict remains unresolved to this day. As for this current conflict, both nations blame the other, while the UN is calling for it to end. 
Many Armenians view this fight through the lens of the 1915 genocide when Turkey slaughtered 1.5 million Armenians. It is absolutely not inflammatory language when I say that this is Turkey's policy to continue the Armenian genocide. Let us look at what Turkey is implementing in the Mediterranean, in Libya, in Syria, in Iraq. To me, there is no doubt that this is a policy of continuing the Armenian genocide and a policy of reinstating the Turkish Empire. Family Research Council senior fellow Leela Gilbert told CBN's Gary Lane it's more than a territorial dispute. It is definitely a religious uh, conflict, and one of the things that's very hard to find in the regular media is that that's the reason. It's usually referred to as ethnic or territorial, but it is clearly a religious, and at this point, Turkey has jumped in with mercenaries, actually jihadis, and this is making it all the more volatile. His agenda is a neo-Ottoman empire, as far as anyone can tell, with him as the caliph. And that's why Turkey's president, Recep Erdogan, takes this stance. The brotherly Azerbaijani state has started a major offensive to defend its own lands and to liberate Nagorno-Karabakh, which is under occupation. The Azerbaijani army, which is advancing successfully on the front, has liberated many places. With all our capability and all our heart, we will continue to be by Azerbaijan's side. French President Emmanuel Macron accuses Turkey of sending Syrian jihadists to the fight. An international human rights advocate, Baroness Cox, reports that Turkey is now controlling air operations for Azerbaijan. CBN News has learned several European parliaments are discussing telling Erdogan they will not come to the aid of Turkey as a NATO member if requested and are urging the U.S. to do the same. The U.N., Russia and the U.S. have called for a ceasefire, but Azerbaijan says it will be conditional on Armenia's withdrawal from Nagorno-Karabakh. Armenia, a declared Christian nation since the year 301, and its people see this as a struggle for survival, with nowhere to turn but to God. And it goes back to the third century, uh, to the time of St. Gregory, when he brought Christianity. Sergei Rakoba of Mission Eurasia is calling on intercessors to contend for the spiritual destiny of Armenia. I'm speaking on behalf of the Christian nation of Armenia now and challenging the entire uh, Christian family uh, around the globe to pray, to support, uh, to, uh, to remember them when they are trying to defend their sovereign territories in, uh, uh, in their nation now. In the meantime, the fighting rages on. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Excellent report there, as usual, uh, by Chris Mitchell, which you can watch uh, Jerusalem Dateline here on uh, Revelation TV. Uh, Rafi, uh, according to my uh, research and my notes that I did before the program, the current round of conflict in Narago uh, Karabakh started on the 12th of July as Azerbaijani forces launched a series of, series of cross-border attacks against the Armenian northern border of Taush region. Um, we also see that Azerbaijan threatened to launch a missile attack on the unprotected Armenian uh, nuclear power plant on the 16th of July uh, of this year, 2020, and then Turkey offered military assistance. So um, this is very, very serious, isn't it? Not only for that particular region, but also for Armenia as a whole. The, the, the fact is the Armenians, uh, so the Azerbaijanis, um, perpetuated this conflict and then even threatened to blow up a nuclear power station uh, which would devastate Armenia and, and cause millions of deaths. That is correct. Um, the situation is uh, very serious. Uh, it could have severe um, repercussions in the, not only in the Middle East but uh, probably uh, to the Eastern Europe and in the world. Uh, what is obviously the case is uh, definite involvement from Turkey and also support from Israel, uh, which is serious concern, especially on behalf of Israel that uh, well, very well knows about the Armenian genocide, but uh, the government hasn't accepted or acknowledged that there was a genocide, although they've experienced the Holocaust and they're trying to deny the genocide. Um, having said that, several uh, uh, 
Israeli uh, intellectuals and historians have acknowledged the genocide and, and the they are pressurizing also, yeah. the country to do so. And the president of Israel has also recognized yeah. that as well. Yeah. Um, now, going back to the problem and uh, what was uh, shown through the report uh, announcement by Erdogan, um, he's making a grave mistake in what he actually announces, and that is the uh, liberation aspect of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, liberate from what, what the people that live in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh have been there for centuries well before the Turkic nations populated the uh, Azerbaijan region as known now. Uh, so there are the people that belong to that land and there, there is no way that you would liberate anything from uh, in the sense that what Erdogan is referring to. Uh, the correct reference would be, let's make Azerbaijan realize that these are the people that belong to this country now at the time uh, and let's be kind to them and let them help the country develop even further, which could have been an outcome. Uh, whereas it's exactly the opposite, uh, just like how Armenians contributed in the Ottoman Empire to the uh, growth of the economy and uh, the politics, the uh, commerce and everything, uh, and how the uh, Ottoman government or the Young Turks turned against the Armenians, is the same thing happening in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, and uh, as a result, the Armenians know what the consequence of opening the doors will be. The other point which is significant is the case of putting a condition. If you are ready to negotiate, you will not put a condition. If you're putting a condition, then you're not negotiating. So that is a critical error again made on behalf of uh, Azerbaijan that is obviously listening to what the bigger brother Turkey is advising. Uh, that is a situation that needs to change, and I'm hoping that uh, in this case, uh, specifically Russia, and uh, with the help of uh, the Minsk uh, cooperation, in other words, uh, France and the United States, uh, will come to their senses and try and resolve the situation as much as possible peacefully. Uh, but to ask for the Armenian forces to withdraw, uh, is ridiculous because uh, that would be the end of uh, the people living in Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, and what's so disturbing, I think, is the role of um, Turkey in, in all of this and President Erdogan. The, the fact that uh, he's already in conflict with, uh, with Greece right now, with Cyprus, with Syria, and um, also with Libya and Yemen uh, and Iraq and has opened up a new front in Armenia. Uh, but the most dangerous thing I think he's doing is actually sending over jihadi fighters from Syria uh, and also from Libya, who represent the Muslim Brotherhood, um, to join forces with the Azerbaijan forces as well, um, as well as providing military assistance to Azerbaijan, knowing that Turkey is a NATO member. And, uh, and frankly, uh, Rafi, what concerns me the most is how quiet the mainstream media are on this, on this issue, but also uh, the United States uh, and other European nations should really be calling out the Turks for their instigation in a th effectively what could become another genocide against your people. Yes, you addressed, Simon, quite a broad uh, range of issues there. Uh, the role of Turkey to start with, um, since uh, David Toglu was the foreign minister in Turkey, there has been a huge amount of work done on Turkey's foreign policy. Uh, what became significant was that Turkey's uh, ambition to extend its influence in the Middle East and in Eastern, towards Eastern Europe, towards South Southern regions, uh, has become very clearly the case, and the, the proof is there, there is no need to um, question that. Uh, their influence on the Islamist movements has been significant, even when ISIS was operating um, effectively in its backyard. Turkey didn't take any measures to su uh, suppress that. Um, and it caused huge amounts of problems in the region, uh, particularly in Iraq and in uh, Syria. It caused the displacement of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, it created an untenable situation for Europe to try and accommodate the refugees. Um, so the consequence and the repercussions of what Turkey does uh, has a huge uh, impact on the, in the world, and particularly in Europe. Uh, 
And I would emphasize that European leaders and the politics that uh, drives Europe forward need to really uh, look at Turkey as a, a very sensitive matter. Uh, and if we're not careful, Turkish influence will become what it used to be and very similar to what it used to be during the Ottoman Empire. And it will subjugate uh, the nations that live uh, around Turkey, whether it's to the east or to the south, and uh, will also extend into the previous uh, regions or countries that now are independent in the Soviet Union, like Uzbekistan and, and uh, Kazakhstan, which are Turkic and uh, Turkish speaking. Uh, they are already broadcasting their TV channels and so on that uh, has made it quite popular in these countries. So we really need to be very careful as to how we negotiate and how we deal with Turkey. The other point you mentioned was NATO. The fact that Turkey is uh, an important uh, part of NATO and especially uh, at the um, boundary of, uh, let's say, the Russian uh, threat as such as NATO defines it, um, makes Turkey or gives Turkey a huge advantage that it can use when it's negotiating deals with Russia, when it's negotiating deals with NATO countries. Um, however, in this case, Turkey's involvement as a NATO country uh, cannot be uh, unnoticed. Obviously, United Sorry. States and other NATO partners are aware of what's happening. Uh, and I'm assuming, and I think I'm correct to assume, that, that they have given the go-ahead for Turkey to do what it wants to do. And it has many reasons as to why uh, this is taking place. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, the um, effectively minimizing the influence of Iran in the region. In other words, if uh, Turkey's influence increases, then Iran's influence in the region decreases, which would be something that the uh, United States and its allies will be looking for. Uh, the other thing that is definitely part of the equation is uh, what is important in Azerbaijan, and that is critically the oil. Now, if Turkey manages to extend its influence into Azerbaijan and beyond, then all the oil-rich countries will become part of Turkish influence. Uh, and the supply to the world, and especially Western world, would be under their influence, if not under their control. So strategically, this is a huge equation that we are looking at. And if uh, they allow Turkey to uh, implement its program and uh, achieve it, then we are talking about quite a significant impact on uh, especially Europe in this case. Because there's two things I'd like to add. The, the first thing is that the fact that uh, Erdogan's policies in Libya is to essentially grab and take control of the uh, Libyan oil for its own uses. And also the fact that there's only two Christian nations that stand in the way of Erdogan's plan to kind of Islamize the Caucasus, and that's Armenia, uh, and also Georgia as well. And knowing that uh, Erdogan is sponsoring uh, Muslim Brotherhood jihadi terrorists to fight alongside the Azerbaijanis, they are then turning Azerbaijan into potentially an Islamic state under Sharia law. So is, is the West not being a bit um, backwards in its thinking? It, it's time now to actually challenge President Erdogan uh, of, of Turkey, defend what is one of the only very few Christian nations um, in the Caucasus uh, and a, a democratic nation. Um, so surely the West should rally behind Armenia at this time. That is true. Um, now, th there are two parts to this story. One is uh, the fact of Muslims and Christians. Uh, we need to, I think, accept the fact that there are many Islamic countries uh, that Armenians live as Christians without any problems. Yeah. So the true nature of the issue is not the religion. Uh, I think in this case specifically, and the, as far as Turkish influence is uh, concerned, it's the 
old program, by saying old program, I'm coming from the uh, collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the Young Turks and then the uh, establishment of Turkey. Uh, what is clearly part of their policy is pan-Turkism. Uh, in other words, all the Turkic people or nations, they unite and they become a more powerful uh, entity as such in the reality of the politics in the world. Uh, you could compare that in a similar manner by the Arabic uh, speaking nations and the attempts that they made to become united and they've never managed to uh, achieve that. Um, on the contrary, Turkey is managing to achieve some of that element uh, in its critical program. And uh, if that is allowed, then the influence that that unity will bring onto the world politics and economics, uh, it will be significant. Uh, it, this is something that, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, politicians of the world now need to be very vigilant, they need to be fully aware of what that implies, and then consider their decisions carefully and accordingly. Absolutely. So let's have a look at this uh, excellent news report that looks at the conflict in Armenia and Ab Azerbaijan. This is Nagorno-Karabakh, a breakaway region in the center of dispute between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The line of contact was formed in 1994 to separate armed forces between the two countries after a deadly war. The enclave in the South Caucasus is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, but it is controlled by ethnic Armenians. And most recently, military clashes between the two countries erupted, leading to hundreds of casualties, with each accusing the other of firing missiles at the other's territory, including civilian areas. To understand why we're seeing a resurgence of deadly violence in the region, we need to look back. In the 1920s, both Armenia and Azerbaijan became part of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union uh, went through a process of obviously of allocating territories, deciding on its internal structure. Um, and the decision was taken uh, to, to leave this area. It had been under Azerbaijani control uh, at the time of reincorporation into the Soviet state. It was left with Azerbaijan, but the local Armenian majority uh, never accepted this. For decades, the majority ethnic Armenians in the region, backed by the Armenian government, demanded to be under Armenian rule. So when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the two republics, Armenia and Azerbaijan, were born at war. It is estimated that tens of thousands of people died and up to a million were displaced amid reports of ethnic cleansing and massacres committed by both sides. When the war ended in 1994, a ceasefire was put in place, but the region remained contested. There was an Armenian military victory, but to this day, it is not recognized by any country, including Armenia, as an independent republic. What makes today's conflict particularly concerning is if neighboring powerhouses Turkey and Russia get involved. If this happens, experts say this could further escalate the conflict, as it has done in other proxy wars backed by the two countries. What we're seeing is effectively the emergence of this conflict as a third theater alongside Libya and Syria, where Russia and Turkey are involved, are supporting opposing factions or proxies, um, uh, and basically looking to extend their geopolitical uh, influence. So far, Russia has called for an end to the fighting, while Turkey has said it will support Azerbaijan in the clashes. NATO and members of the international community, including Canada, have called for an immediate ceasefire as the death toll increases. Although the future of the contested region remains unknown, experts say we need to reevaluate the mediation process because at the end of the day, human massacre and loss are at stake. Emanuela Campanella, Global News. Uh, it's time to pray and to stand with the Armenian people, as uh, this is a real 
uh, struggle uh, for survival. Uh, we're down to the last three minutes of the programme, uh, Rafi. Um, what role can our viewers play? Uh, of course, we need to pray for Armenia and particularly this conflict, but, but also what can be done kind of politically to let our members of parliament know, to uh, let the foreign office know and our prime minister to know that this is one of the very few Christian nations in the Caucasus and they're under threat and that President Erdogan of Turkey has a deliberate stake um, in this conflict. That is true. Now, the, uh, there are a few key steps that uh, viewers can take. One is to write to their MP and ask for recognition of the um, independence of Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. This is a, a referendum that they um, presented at the same time as Azerbaijan and Armenia did and other uh, countries, Georgia, etc. And uh, that right has t totally been ignored. Uh, if Azeri people can ask for independence, why can't the Armenians in Azerbaijan that have lived there for centuries ask for independence? Um, so that is one of the first things to do. The second thing is to write to the foreign minister, because uh, that is where the key influences uh, are. Uh, therefore, explaining to them that uh, you know what they've witnessed in the documentary that has presented and from history, if they've researched and learned, they could see why it's important that uh, people that have lived there for centuries should have the right to continue their life and their, live there happily with their families and to create. The uh, last point that is quite important, and especially at this point in time, uh, as the uh, conflict develops, is that the OSCE uh, that is negotiating the uh, peace situation, they need to make decisive uh, s steps in order to control the situation. They can't allow uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey to do what they wish. They need to put a control in place and drive this peace process forward and hopefully come to a solution that would resolve uh, the conflict. Rafi, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest on today's Middle East Report and just let you know that uh, we're standing with you and the Armenian people. Thank you very much, Simon. For, for truth. And uh, we want to thank you for watching this programme today. It's so important that we stand with uh, Christian Armenia under attack from forces by Azerbaijan, backed up by jihadis and also sponsored by Turkey. And uh, we uh, frankly can't allow President Erdogan to get away with bullying a Christian nation in the Caucasus. So it's important that we pray for Armenia, that we write to our MPs and also our foreign minister regarding the situation that Armenia faces. So I want to thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. Turkey must admit to crimes Cause we stand here and